Give it uh, one more minute. I think a lot of people still. I don't know if Sarah can click that fast to let all everyone <laughs> in. We have more than forty right now, right? Yeah, forty-six. It looks like. Okay. Forty-six, and I think uh, near hundred signed up. You know, it's good because usually when we do lecture and learns, I don't think we have 100 seats. So this is just an amplifier. <laughs> Might as well start it off and the, the stragglers can catch <laughs> up or, or watch the video, uh, which will be made available uh, later on once it's all done. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, good morning. My, my name is Mike Pillick. I'm one of the uh, partners at Odell in the Southwestern Ontario office and, and Ottawa offices. Um, today we have with us Josh Gardner and Sohil from Spring Air Systems. Uh, you might be able to see them wave. I could see them wave, but uh, they're, they're there. Um, so they'll be educating us on um, commercial kitchen ventilation and just 
getting us uh, some tips and tricks on on how to maximize our energy savings codes. I'm going through just uh, some of the, the basics and some of the things that we might not know or you might not know in terms of design work. Um, Odell has been a representative of Spring Air for, uh, oh, it's uh, since 80, <laughs> late 80s, 88 or 89. Um, Chuck Odell and Tom Mills were, were partners at an or, uh acquaintances at another um hvac company and they left to do their own thing and and tom did spring air and chuck odell did odell associates so uh what it all comes around uh, full force here um so uh appreciate everyone being here and uh if there is any questions click that uh, raise your hand button over there or just type it in the in the group chat um and we'll open everything up to discussion later on uh and i'll let josh take it from here Thanks, Mike. Um, and yeah, Mike touched upon it, but uh, at Spring Air here, we kind of look at commercial kitchen ventilation, which is really all we do, um, as kind of a dual mandate where we want to always maximize energy savings. That's what Spring Air was founded on. But we do understand that reducing capital costs is also something um, that everyone in the value chain is looking for. So that means owners, architects, engineers, consultants, uh, contractors. Uh, everybody seems to be um, getting into what's the lowest price we can do this for. We also just want to make sure people understand that the trade-offs of sometimes going um, with just the, the value-based system. Um, so the agenda for the day, and it's a long one, but I'll hopefully be brief on most of it. Um, we're going to do an overview of commercial kitchen ventilation, um, the basic concepts of it, an overview, along with some codes and regulations. Um, this is one of the things that, where we get questions quite frequently from so many different people um, and some of them are like so I don't want to say arcane but very specific um, others are very general um, so I'll try to go through some of the questions we get most often um, and then we'll walk through really our design process um, and how we look at commercial kitchen ventilation because it is really if you look at any restaurant um, or institution that has a kitchen in it the kitchen um, is usually the biggest energy hog in the building and that usually is a result of two different things. One is refrigeration, so walk-in um, freezers and refrigerators, and then commercial kitchen ventilation, and we'll go through that. Um, our approach focuses on high-efficiency hoods, um, then demand control, and then energy recovery. Uh, then we just walk through some of the costs associated with that, um, and then I'll tell you about some new products that we've launched in the marketplace over the uh, some recent years. So from commercial kitchen ventilation, um, it's weird and maybe it's because it's our business. Um, it is kind of a big deal. Um, the biggest thing with it is when you think about commercial kitchen ventilation, um, you're talking about grease laden vapors um, essentially being produced in the kitchen and needing to get out of the building. And that's why everything um, that's in the industry, the first really consideration for it is safety. And that's where you have codes um, like UL codes that come in as well as NFPA 96 building codes to make sure that as that highly flammable grease is present, we're making sure to contain it in a safe manner um, should a fire occur. Um, the second thing that really goes um, up is performance. So if you look at just NF NFPA 96, um, there are some guidances about CFMs per linear foot. Um, and they basically say you need this minimum linear per foot to effectively move the smoke and grease out of the building. Um, but what the really cool thing is, um, some manufacturers focus on the next level up, um, which is energy efficiency. So that's doing all the safe removal of grease and odors from the building, but doing it um, with the least energy requirements possible. Um, I don't know about everyone on the call, turns out there's a lot of people, uh, but my energy bills have not been going down. Um, and I think that's a trend that's probably going to be long term as we go towards um, more renewable sources of, of energy. Sorry. Um, so to touch on the safety piece, um, this is really where codes and regulations come into play. And for us, there's really three main buckets uh, for codes and regulations, and that's NFPA 96. Um, so it's the National Fire Prevention Act, um, and that focuses on, again, really the safety aspect, which is materials, clearances, construction, uh, distances from combustibles, um, how often to clean it, and uh, what a prescribed use 
for the equipment is. Um, a second organization, which is a little more focused on, um, call it efficiency and performance, um, is ASHRAE. Um, so they're going to look at specific applications uh, for commercial kitchen ventilation, um, have some guidance around energy consumption, and mandate some technologies um, specifically to minimize uh, energy consumption, and also some guidance around sequence of operations. So this is things like, um, in the event of a fire, we want the exhaust fan to go to full um, or to stop, and in the um, the makeup air to uh, remain on, things like that. Um, and then the last thing is UL and ETL. Uh, most of you know um, products with the UL and ETL mark. Um, so they are listing and testing agencies. Um, so basically they develop standards um, where they say, yes, if a product meets these standards, it is deemed safe. It's almost when an inspector is looking at um, products that are being specified on a project and installed, um, it's kind of like a good housekeeping seal of approval. So they can just rest assured knowing that if it's got an ETL mark that it's built to a, a certain standard. Um, the interesting thing here is while these organizations are all important, um, the one that really has the final say at the end of the day is the AHJ. And pretty well everybody in the room knows what the AHJ is, that's the authority having jurisdiction. So in most cases, they're the last people signing off on a project um, or the ones issuing permits at the beginning. Um, they get to interpret the codes, interpret um, the standards and enforce them almost as they see fit. Um, but they can really draw and utilize any of the, the three buckets below. For an FPA 96, um, this is something that comes out, um, I would say biannually um, with updates. Um, there are a significant number of changes regularly, and most of the changes are geared toward adding clarity um, to the standards so that people understand them. For the latest update, uh, we've got new definitions of non-combustible and limited combustible materials. Uh, in addition, uh, previously, NFPA 96 did not state that filters in hoods needed to be listed. However, now uh, it is a requirement from NFPA 96, so not just a UL or ETL uh, mark. They also established a method of measurement for grease deposits. Uh, so this is essentially depending on how much cooking you're doing, how often you need to inspect your ducts, and how often you need to clean them. Uh, but they've got a measurement tool uh, out now. All grease fans must be listed to the UL 762 standard. Uh, so that's the commercial uh, kitchen ventilation standard. Fans with a motor and airstream must be hinged to curb. So that just allows them to flip open for easy access and cleaning. Uh, thermal start is now a requirement uh, in NFPA 96, and this is in force in Ontario. Uh, this is something we saw, I wanna say about a year ago, um, where it had been on the books for a long time, and now it's starting to be enforced at the local level. So it is a default for us as we design a system, um, thermal start is automatically selected. Uh, there are a few updates with regards to fire suppression. Uh, basically, they say uh, whenever there are changes to cooking appliances or cooking mediums, we need to update the system. Um, and that's simply because as the system was designed and specified, it's very specific nozzles, uh, flow points, and things like that for the equipment underneath it. And if you change that equipment, that can significantly change um, the performance of the fire suppression system and essentially make it so it's not functional um, in the event of a fire. Uh, last thing to note is solid fuel. Most people, and actually this is something we see more and more of, is solid fuel in restaurants. Um, the pain with solid fuel is that it requires a totally separate system from the main duct run. And so it's got to have its own duct run, its own exhaust fan. Um, obviously, supply doesn't matter, uh, but uh, that's a significant cost in a lot of cases, um, especially when you're growing in multi-story mixed-use buildings. There are some appliances per NFPA 96 that don't require their own duct run, but there are like 11 requirements to get that seal of approval uh, from, that, from NFPA 96, and there are very few appliances out there. Most of the appliance manufacturers out there um, that use solid fuel will be very specific in stating that it's NFPA 96 compliant to not require its own duct run. Um, and they're usually just using the solid fuel for, for flavoring, not for actual heat production. Uh, the next thing to go through for us is ASHRAE 90.1. Um, 
this is again, this is um, a standard that's really geared at, hey, we know there are lots of kitchens, they use a lot of energy. What can we do to make sure they're energy efficient? And so basically ASHRAE 90.1 states that any kitchen over 5,000 CFM needs to be energy efficient in one of three ways. Um, first is they can use half of their fresh air, must be transfer air. So this works in really big, really open spaces, stadiums, grocery stores, things like that. Um, a second way to do it is with heat recovery. So a heat recovery device with a minimum of 40% efficiency must be on at least half of the exhaust volume that's going out of the building. Uh, the third way and really the most popular, most cost-effective way is that at least three quarters of the exhaust must have demand ventilation with a minimum of 50% modulation. So that means that when a appliance or, or cooking lineup is on and full blast, um, that exhaust is going to be running at full speed, but when it's not using that um, exhaust system needs to be able to turn down 50% or cut its exhaust volume in half. Um, this also limited compensating hoods to send 10% supply air. So a compensating hood is a hood that uses um, fresh air, so supply air, to actually boost the exhaust through the hood. Um, these were popular, I mean, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, they've slowly become less and less popular. And then uh, the last, this is ASHRAE 62, um, and it states that exhaust duct passing through fire compartments must be negatively pressurized relative to the space that they pass. Um, long story short about that is essentially, if you're putting a duct through a fire compartment, uh, you need to have a booster fan uh, or have a fan at the end of the duct so that as the air passes through that, it's negatively pressurized. Um, we've seen places in the past where we put um, one of our ecology units in and that's pushing the air through the duct. Um, and if the duct work is not 100% sealed, which should be tested on an installation, but um, doesn't always happen, uh, it can be pushing grease, odors, um, and smoke into the building. And so that's why having a, a fan at the end to negatively pressurize that duct is required. IMC is a US-based standard. Um, it is closer to NFPA 96 and that the focus is on safety. Thermal start has always been a requirement for it. Um, and then just a small caveat here, IMC is a little bit more picky than NFPA when it comes to acceptance of listed products. So they would say that just because a thing has been tested to a UL standard, they don't necessarily accept it. Um, so to talk through the listing agencies quickly, um, there are really two big ones that you'll see their seals of approval on, and that's UL slash ULC and ETL. Um, UL is really the original one, and it was founded in 1894. Uh, they were purely focused on safety, didn't care about making money. They were actually a nonprofit organization. However, that changed in 2012 when they became a for-profit company. We have noticed some changes as a result of that. Um, some good, not, some not so great. Uh, their main focus has been on North America. Um, they have spread adoption throughout the world, really. There are a lot of develop not. I should say developing countries, a lot of non-North American countries that default to UL standards and using UL standards um, because they are deemed as best in class in most cases. UL has, um, from its inception, had a very close tie with the National Fire Protection um, Act. So they actually work hand in hand on a lot of things. However, this is one thing we've seen some separation from in the more recent years. Um, where actually UL will create a standard without really consulting NFPA. And as a result, there are some things in NFPA where they say specifically, uh, shall not even if it is UL listed. Um, an example of that is downgrading ductwork after a KES system. Uh, ETL um, started out more as a European country. However, they're rapidly gaining strength in North America. I would say most listings most new listings probably lean toward ETL. They have proved to be a little easier to deal with. However, that advantage is going away as they compete with UL for business. Uh, the difference between the two agencies is that while they both test products to develop standards, UL is the only one that actually develops the standards um, for use in the industry. Uh, lastly, the AHJ. Um, so we talked briefly about this. This is whoever has the final say in equipment and installation. Uh, the adoption is the localized process of adopting the codes. So this is where oftentimes codes roll out pretty slowly. We see that um, maybe in 2010, um, Ontario announced that they would be 
uh, adopting the latest version of NFPA 96, but they probably said it's not going to be effective until 2018. Um, that's done. I mean, it's a little bit of bureaucracy is the reason, but it also helps make sure that projects that are designed and specified can go to tender and construction without modifications that could significantly change uh, the cost or design of the projects. Uh, I put your mileage may vary here um, just because the AHJ is always one of those interesting things where they are the ones interpreting the codes. And I think we've got an overall trend um, where some of the inspectors who have been in the industry for a long time are starting to retire. Uh, they're bringing in new inspectors who don't have the same experience or understanding of the codes. And as I'm sure you all know, the codes can be very dense with a lot of information in. And if you don't understand how is the situation um, with regards to the code, you can actually misunderstand some of it. Um, so typically um, when we see these issues is when we'll get calls and we'll, you know, get in and we'll explain, okay, you can't really use a gas code on commercial kitchen ventilation. It's just not meant to be interpreted that way. Um, and sometimes those are easy conversations. Sometimes those are hard conversations. So now getting back to the principles of commercial kitchen ventilation, when we look at commercial kitchen ventilation, for us, it all starts with appliances. Each appliance really, as you look at it, um, develops a different type of heat, um, different type of cooking effluent. So that's grease, smoke, and odors that come off during the cooking process. And so we actually, when we're designing the system, um, we won't really issue drawings without knowing what appliances are under the hood, because that really dictates how much exhaust volume we need um, to operate uh, in a safe and effective manner. From there, so once we have the appliances, we design hoods um, for the restaurant. And that's really, so this is where typically, um, if you're looking at the dividing line between what we call food service and engineering, a lot of times right above the hood is where the line is drawn. Uh, the food service consultants are specifying appliances and hoods. Um, but the interesting thing there is, Everything that happens further on is really a direct result of the hood selection. Um, so we are seeing more and more en of the engineering community get involved in hood selection. We just like to make sure that we're facilitating the communication to make sure that things are um, continuing as updated. Uh, oftentimes appliance get changed, uh, moved out, uh, swapped around, and because that changes the hood selections, we need to make sure everybody on the design team is involved with that. Um, so obviously with the hoods, uh, we need to remove that hot air, grease and smoke out of the kitchen. So in this situation, we've got an exhaust duct hooked to those hoods. Um, it's showing through a pollution control unit, but it could just be an exhaust fan into the atmosphere. Um, the interesting thing here is um, a lot of people underestimate um, what exactly drives the high energy consumption and really it's the supplier which is the biggest piece if you think about a typical like a full service restaurant you're probably looking at about 5,000 uh, cubic feet per minute of air leaving the restaurant uh, during high cooking um, for me when I think about it that's like 5,000 footballs of air every minute um, in Canada I mean it's kind of warm out today but you're still got to heat that air up from I think we're probably up to four degrees now, all the way up to call it 20 degrees um, to make sure that the kitchen is comfortable. Um, whereas most other applications for heating and cooling use recirculation. So it's just keeping the air in the space at a certain temperature. With commercial kitchen ventilation, we're bringing in a ton of fresh air that needs to be tempered. Um, so heated in the winter, cooled in the summer. Uh, when I started at Spring Air, we saw about 5% of our projects had uh, mechanical cooling on. We're up to about one out of every four projects now has mechanical cooling on. Uh, it is just more and more important um, from a labor perspective that people are working in an environment uh, that's friendly and conducive. Uh, moving on to energy savings. Um, so for us, we look at three different steps for energy savings. The first is the hoods. Secondly is demand control. And last is heat recovery. Um, and these are really in uh, declining payback. So we find uh, selecting high efficiency hoods to be the most effective and quickest payback. Using demand control will have a slightly longer payback and heat recovery will have the longest payback in most cases. Um, obviously depends on climate a lot. Um, as we look at our example projects, again, we're starting to look at all the appliances. So we put these appliances into our software um, and based on all of the appliances, we generate hood selections. Um, so in this case, we've got two back-to-back -back hoods. 
Uh, we've also got a mechanical filtration unit, what we call a KES, a supply unit. Um, in this case, I think it's heating and cooling, and then a duct run that we've uh, put together. So the first step for us is high efficiency hoods. Uh, we use a product um, that we engineered and designed called Dynaflow. Um, it's really flexible for us um, and allows us to do three things with the air. So as we bring in supply air, we distribute roughly 80 to 90% of it um, through front facing plenums that actually push out and up towards the ceiling. That makes sure that uh, the supply air is evenly distributed through the space and minimizes the opportunities for drafts. The, la the second uh, part where we're directing the air is the capture and containment zone. And this is actually the most important zone for energy efficiency. We're taking a little bit of the supply air and blowing it back towards the appliances. Um, this encourages the nat natural rolling of smoke in the hood um, so that as we're exhausting at lower volumes, we can make sure to contain the smoke um, in the hood because uh, once smoke is out of the hood, you're never going to get it back in the hood uh, no matter what you do. Um, and so that's the key for energy efficiency. Uh, the last thing that makes us uh, different um, from, I, I don't think anybody else has this, we have a comfort control dial um, where we can actually think of it like your car vents, um, where we can open and close a little bit of fresh air coming down on the operator. So as you're cooking in the kitchen, uh, you can hopefully handle the heat a little bit better because you can get a little bit of uh, tempered fresh air um, right essentially down over your shoulders. Uh, the cool thing for us about the Dynaflow hoods is that they're very customizable. There are really very few um, projects where we cannot use a Dynaflow hood because they're so flexible. Um, we can move them up or down. We can actually, we've actually listed all the way up to 87 inches from a mounting height perspective. Um, we've got all different configurations. We've got wall hoods, island hoods, um, some other more less, uh, less used ones. Um, we're actually adjusting every 33 inches within the baffles to allow for the minimum exhaust volume that allows us to make sure the air curtain is appropriate for the appliances that are under it um, to be effective. So let's look at what we're doing from a reduced volume perspective. Um, when we look at uh, traditional filter hoods, um, so that's your, I mean, it's probably going to be the cheapest hoods in the market that you can find. Um, they're using uh, their listing volumes or NFPA guidance. Um, our Dynaflow hood for this project was just over 5,000 CFM. We look at the Red Event um, traditional filter hoods and we're at 8,000 CFM. Uh, so that's a pretty significant decrease. Uh, the supply volume is just proportional. We typically design at 95% of fresh air, um, but we go as low as 80% depending on the needs of uh, the engineer and how much transfer air is in the space. Uh, from a duct collar perspective, using the high efficiency hood lets us just have one duct collar per hood, whereas um, from a straight filter hood perspective, we actually require two duct collars. And that's just because uh, the duct, if we tried to use a single duct collar on that hood, it wouldn't have fit over the extractor properly. Um, we could have done it with a, a rectangular, but this client wanted a round duct. Um, and then the lastly, the common duct size. So that's the duct size that collects the two hoods and discharges in this way, this example through the KES and out into the atmosphere. Um, we drop that by six inches in diameter. So that means uh, less, expected, less, less expensive duct work. So as we look at what that really delivers for us, um, switching to Dynaflow, the high efficiency exhaust, nets us about $8,000 in annual savings. Um, we have a program in our system which allows um, anyone using it to generate energy savings um, and you can manipulate all of the cost inputs so if you know your electricity cost per kilowatt hour or your heating cost per million BTU you just input that with your operating hours and we use uh, ASHRAE based location data uh, to calculate based on de degree days um, to give you your energy savings. So the second step when it comes to energy savings is demand controls. So now that we've reduced the overall need um, for exhaust volume, so in this last example, we went from about 8,000 to about 5,000 CFM. And I think about that as kind of like if you're uh, a race car driver, you want your car as light as possible, but the same horsepower. That means it goes around the track better, faster, um, and is more efficient. That's what we're doing by selecting high efficiency hoods. The second step here is using demand control. So that allows the exhaust and supply to modulate up and down throughout the day based on how much is being cooked. 
um, and how much those appliances are being used. So here you can see kind of an overview of how we set up our systems. Um, it just shows the different components. We do use uh, zone flow demand dampers, and so these are modulating dampers that allow you to put, uh, I think it's up to 16 uh, hoods on one exhaust run. And as long as um, they're configured properly, that means if one hood needs 100% uh, of exhaust capacity, they don't all have to have it run at 100% exhaust capacity. Um, you can run at a fraction of that, um, a lot, assuming the other hoods are not in production. Um, TrueFlow actually, something kind of neat here, um, it's recognized by the US Environmental Protection Agency as a technology to use significantly less energy than traditional systems. Um, when we put it into systems, we see about a 20% reduction in energy costs with no behavior change whatsoever. So that's just based on how they use their appliances throughout the day. Uh, instead of running the exhaust at 100% um, all the time, uh, on average, they're gonna be running 20% less. Um, we know that uh, doing something without taking any action is best. However, we do try to augment the savings with a visual cue. So this is um, a quick representation of that visual cue. So we basically show the operator how much of their capacity they're using. Um, and for us, as long as they're below 70%, we're calling it green. That's a, a good energy efficient use of efficiency. Um, if that bar creeps up into uh, yellow or red. Uh, red indicates that it's at 100% capacity, which is great. If you're actually cooking meals for a diner full of uh, patrons, we have no issue with you using all of that. As a matter of fact, you actually need all of that exhaust volume to properly exhaust into the space. Um, but if uh, you've just got all the appliances on, maybe go through, um, turn off half your boilers, turn off one of the fryers, um, and things like that. Um, from a technology standpoint, we tie in um, with most building management systems. Um, typically, we're using BACnet now. I don't know the last time we sold a system with Lawn, but I'm sure we have um, recently because there's all sorts of technology out there. But BACnet is, is really an easy one for most of the building management people to uh, focus on. So now when we look at adding in the TrueFlow piece, um, you can see the true flow heating, cooling, and motor savings. So those are um, three pieces here. The heating savings, obviously, because we're this project was in Ottawa, um, we're reducing the heating needs pretty significantly, um, less natural gas because we're modulating that system down. Um, cooling, uh, there's a few months, believe it or not, uh, where we do want some cooling, uh, but the costs or savings are not huge. Um, unless there's mechanical cooling on the project. In that case, um, those numbers go up pretty quickly because uh, electricity is not cheap. Um, and then the motor savings. So that's just the electricity required to run the motors at full speed versus what we're doing with modulation. So there you can see our annual savings uh, move from about $8,000 to about $15,000. So it's more augmentation. Um, again, we'll go through it with capital costs, but there is a cost benefit analysis that we like to show people. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sohail, uh, who's yeah. going to talk about heat recovery. Uh, Josh, could you please uh, keep sharing and um, changing the slides? That's yeah, easier. absolutely. You just yeah, okay. Let me know when. Okay, the third step is uh, heat recovery by using run around gly glycol coils. So if we have um, a pollution control unit, uh, we take out the grease by filtration uh, in three stages that we have in our KS system. And uh, the hot air without the grease is good for recovering heat because that is otherwise lost. And we still have to preheat um, the um, or heat the uh, uh, supply air. So we can use this um, opportunity to use part of that exhaust air uh, energy to preheat and uh, heat the um, uh, supply air to the extent that we uh, reduce uh, substantially the utility cost. So the system is very simple. It consists of two coils. Basically, um, the media here is a fluid, uh, up to 50% glycol, propylene glycol, circulating in, uh, in these two uh, coils from one to another. And uh, the blue one is uh, where we have the um, uh, supply air being heated. And the red one is where we have the hot air going out uh, from our uh, pollution control unit. And we uh, recuperate uh, heat from that and use that for preheating. Uh, 
Um, so just give you an example for this uh, example that I showed you, it was 14,000 CFM and we almost recuperate 560,000 BTU MBH, let's say per hour. So uh, to showcase some of the uh, uh, units that are good for this application, typically over 10,000 uh, CFM is uh, economically viable for this kind of investment. So this is um, a 35,000 CFM. It was for um, a, a big hood, uh, food court in Montreal. And most of the time we have limitations in the space. So restriction in terms of uh, dimensions of the system because it's in a tight mechanical room uh, urges us to size the coils based on what we have in terms of space. And uh, I may end up uh, having multiple coils stacked, staggered, as you see here in this case. For this uh, system, we are recovering 1.4 million BTU per hour. Next, uh, yeah. So this is the another look from inside. It's uh, you see that it's um, uh, four coils, uh, two stacked on each other, and uh, the configuration is staggered so that we can have um, uh, the the system uh, based on what uh, size we had available. Uh, next, please. Yeah. And then uh, this is another one for 22,000 CFM uh, and uh, 0.9 million BTU per hour. As you see, we can uh, have these coils staggered here, like three of them are stacked here. So uh, most of the time we need to make a header, as you see on the table, uh, like a stainless steel uh, uh, pressure tested header to combine the inlet and outlet of supply and return from these coils. Uh, next, please. Yeah, this is the uh, view, another view. Um, one thing that I wanted to showcase is the ability to meet the requirements of clients with different shapes and um, customization of the uh, fan box. In this case, they had uh, a tight uh, mechanical room with uh, multiple duct uh, duct uh, work around the system. So the discharge was from top side and you see the uh, this is the fan uh, fan box portion that we have the coils three coils stacked and then we have the odor removal uh, uh, pellets after that and then the fan next please so the system is very simple like in uh, uh, it works based on the temperature difference surface area that you provide and uh, heat transfer coefficient and pressure drop uh, on both cloacal and air sides. That are the main concerns for uh, design. So uh, the phase velocity is in the range of 450 to 550 foot per minute. And uh, based on number of rows and uh, number of fins per inch, the, the pressure drop varies. So the more rows, the more uh, number of fins per inch increases the pressure drop on air side. And the, the efficiency is based on uh, the ratio of the recovered heat to available heat. And this is uh, easily calculated based on the temperatures uh, for inlet to the uh, makeup air and exhaust uh, from the KES in this case. And the range of efficiency is in the uh, ballpark of 40 to 60 percent. And next. So this is the, the coil for 15,000 CFM. The size just gives you an idea, like uh, it's about 70 inch length and uh, 58 inch high. And it this one has uh, six, eight, eight rows. Right. Next. Yeah, so we have a software to uh, do the customization of the coil. So for each uh, unit, we have to Consider the, the size, as I mentioned, um, as the main restriction uh, for design, and also number of rows, number of feet, number of high, uh, fins per inches to uh, accommodate maximum energy recovery. And what limits us in that respect is the, the pressure on the fluid side. I typically uh, limit that to five, uh, 10 uh, foot per uh, water, uh, Sorry, the previous one. Oh. Yeah, so 10 oh. foot of water gauge um, um, because the more uh, pressure drop on fluid side may, means that you have to 
spend more energy on the pump uh, energy. And the air side uh, pressure is also uh, is high. Typically, it's in the range of 0 0.7 to, 0, uh, to 1 inch, depending number of rows and fins. And again, adding that to the system means that you are upsizing the fan and the uh, uh, energy on the energy use on that is a little bit higher. So considering all this, we we uh, maximize the heat recovery to compensate for that. And then the uh, glycol in the system is just because uh, in cold places for preheating the uh, supply air, we need to make sure that the the pure water is not freezing in the system. So we have 35 up to 50 percent of propylene glycol in the system. Um, that's it, yeah. So next is the circulating pump. Based on that, so uh, 10 foot of water maximum uh, pressure drop for uh, each coil. So we are looking at 20 plus the whatever is in the fittings and pipe run between the two system. So we can select the pump and the, the GPM is, uh, is typically high up to 100, more than 100 GPM, depending the size of the coil. Uh, next. So uh, just to give you an idea of the simplified uh, calculation for heat recovery in this system. So uh, this is for uh, a case in Toronto designed based on 45% efficiency, 2.5% uh, January as uh, required by national building code, design temperature for winter and also considering 15 hours per day operation, seven days um, and two months of winter from uh, a zero Fahrenheit design temperature for Toronto, we go up to 45 uh, by heating the, pre, uh, the supply air and two months considered as shoulder season, we are going from 32 uh, to about 72 directly. Again, 40%, uh, 40 Fahrenheit uh, temperature rise. So I kept the, um, uh, energy uh, estimation from Enbridge website from 2018, just to compare to what we have this year. So it's, you see that the monthly uh, 1200 is uh, times 12 is like um, about uh, $15,000 uh, annually, whereas it was about 7,000. So it's more than double compared to a couple of years ago, just average based on the amount of um, um, uh, gas that we are using in this case. Okay, next. Yeah, again, I'm showing the, uh, the shoulder seasons, um, March and December kind of in the middle and January, February as the coldest uh, seasons. So two months of shoulder and two months of um, winter uh, design. And uh, the overall, um, uh, saving on the gas side is 20, uh, 27,000 cubic meter and the energy cost as we saw was about 15 grand per year. Next. And if you consider the uh, cost of investment, you may end up something like about four years of uh, 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 return. After four years, you are at break even and um, this is just based on the simplified uh, calculation just for gas side of it, but gives you an idea. The, the bigger the system, the better. So back to you. So Josh. remember that four year number, because um, we're going to look at um, some payback times for the other two technologies and see how they compare. Uh, we did have one quick question. Uh, that is, how do you manage the grease buildup on the heat exchanger? Uh, simply put for us, we never install heat recovery without a KES system. So that's the uh, mechanical grease filtration. Um, we have to, as part of uh, the UL uh, testing, we remove, I think it's 99.97% of grease by weight from the air uh, with our KES so that essentially, the air that is flowing over those heat recovery coils is free from grease. Uh, there is still some there, but it is very, very minimal. Um, any system that does not do that uh, is bound to require significant cleaning um, for the system. So that's how we manage that. Um, so for us, minimizing capital costs. Um, 
the best thing where we find is where if we can manage the project properly and convince the owners that they should reduce their energy costs so they can have better operating costs over the long term, um, but also give them a better capital cost than what they would have with a um, non-high efficiency system. Those are the best cases. We don't always get there, but oftentimes and definitely when we have uh, mechanical cooling on or it's really, really, really cold, we do. Uh, so the example project, you'll remember this. Um, you can see for us, if we just look at uh, the hood costs and controls, um, our very basic system for this project um, will run the end user about $14,000. Um, to go to high efficiency hoods, you are a considerable increase more, so about a 50% increase um, to go with high efficiency hoods. And then when you're stepping up into demand control, you're looking at doubling the cost of the system. Um, so often we see um, this exercise done in isolation. And oftentimes, uh, frankly, it's because it's done on the food service side without any input from the engineering side. Um, so if you're not looking at the energy costs and the mechanical costs of these projects, um, in some cases, it's going to be hard to convince the customer that they should spend 50% more or even double um, on designing with a high efficiency system in mind. Uh, now, the interesting thing for us is when we put the mechanical costs um, involved with it. So we switch everything from um, a standard straight exhaust um, to a high efficiency. Um, we're actually, uh, you're not going to spend any more on the mechanical equipment to go with high efficiency hoods. Um, and it's going to be slightly more um, when you're going with variable volume. Um, system and that's just because VFDs and modulation, um, it doesn't come free when you look at supply units and exhaust units. So you've got to put VFDs on, you've got to put um, dampers in the supply unit um, so that a certain volume is maintained over the burner and things like that. Um, so it is a little bit more expensive. Uh, one note, um, we do have a program that allows um, the specification of engineered ductwork. Um, the manufacturer we've partnered with um, to supply the Canadian marketplace does both round and rectangular. Um, we really like the round, um, but no, it's not always viable. Um, and that's simply because from a static pressure perspective, it has the best um, qualities as compared to a rectangular duct. Um, air just flows through it really nicely. We actually recommend on straight up vertical stacks um, for round duct, you can actually increase your velocity um, to get a smaller duct run in a lot of cases. Um, it's UL listed, so it's got a consistent quality, and it also looks really, really nice. These pictures are from the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market um, in Kitchener-Waterloo, and uh, if you go there and check it out, that's all stuff we supplied uh, through our partner's Odell. Um, it looks great. It also has uh, greatly reduced slope requirements. Uh, additionally, uh, we like to specify the zero clearance edition which means it's got an inner shell and an outer shell. And between those two shells, you've got ceramic fiber insulation. That means you can put it right up against wood structures. Uh, so full on combustibles without any need uh, to worry about that causing a fire. Um, and then I talked about the improved static drainage and efficiency, um, specifically as it relates to round, but also rectangular. Uh, capital cost versus operating cost. So this is where when you look at the capital cost of the full system, um, you'll see actually when we go into Dynaflow, there's no additional expense, which means your payback is actually um, negative. So you're spending really, really, really slightly less uh, when you go to high efficiency hoods. And that's just because we reduce the mechanical package um, that much. Now, when you go and add in demand control, there is an increased total cost for the system. However, when you look uh, at the annual savings um, of about $15,000, again, calculated through the system, you can change all the inputs and we get different paybacks. Uh, you're looking at a payback of about 11 months. Um, we know that most restaurants, uh, it's not the easiest business in the world, but depending on whether you're looking at institutional clients, um, call it mom and pop new restaurants or chains, um, a lot of times they'll look at a 10-year number for their costs for investments. Um, we work with Boston Pizza and they tell us that about every 10 years they want to 
give their restaurants a facelift. Sometimes that's just aesthetic. Sometimes it is aesthetic plus uh, mechanical. So when you look at it, uh, going to high efficiency hood, over 10 years, you're going to save about $80,000. And then uh, going to high efficiency hoods with the demand control, you're going to be saving significantly more um, up in the neighborhood of $130,000, uh, which is pretty significant. When you talk to food service operators, oftentimes, they're playing with pennies when it comes to food costs and things like that, and they really want to save money. Um, so if you can take um, and give them energy savings without even having to do anything, that's great for their business. That, and that's, sorry, this just highlights um, those two numbers. So for us, new products, um, we focus, uh, we like to try and do new things. Actually, we have some people at Spring Air who, I mean, I swear, refuse to do anything out of an existing quiz equipment and only like to think of new ideas, which is great. Um, so we're always playing in the lab, trying to come up with something new. Um, these two things um, that we talk about really solve clearance issues for us. Um, so if you look at kind of uh, traditional hoods, um, you've got a clearance to combustibles of three inches. If you've got modulating or balance or manual balancing dampers, that's about 12 inches required on top of the hood. Um, plus just clearance to combustible. So say you're in St. Jacob's Market, that's got to be 18 inches to any of that wood that you see there. Um, and what we've done is we've put zero clearance panels. Um, this is not new in the industry, but it is uh, pretty convenient. I would say the bigger thing for us is we've actually moved our zone flow dampers inside of the hood. So they don't require any additional clearance on the top of the hood. Um, we launched and patented this probably, I think the patent just got, it's probably a year old now. Um, it took a long time to go through, um, but it's it, it's a nice product. People really like it, uh, just because again, there's no consideration that needs to be made for additional space above the hood. We also offer UV in our hoods. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. I would imagine most people in the room are familiar with UV technology. Um, I'll see if I can get this to play quickly. Um, we like UV when it's properly specified and maintained. Um, the, I guess, legacy issue we've seen with UV is that it was kind of uh, specified very broadly and without a good communication of the maintenance requirements. And there are, if you go through different areas of the country, um, a lot of UV hoods out there that have had their UV systems totally shut off uh, just because people don't want to continue to uh, deal with the maintenance that goes on with them. Jimco Technologies has helped commercial kitchens with fat and grease removal and odor reduction for more than 20 years. Jimco systems are based on UVC and ozone technology that results in the cold incineration of organic matter from a process called photolytic oxidation. The process leaves no harmful residues. UVC light will split the fat and grease particles, which makes them more susceptible to ozone. The ozone will oxidize with the fragmented fat and grease particles. Photolytic oxidation will reduce pollution to the surroundings dramatically. It has been documented that Jimco's technology works and is the only kitchen pollution control system in the world that has an EU Environmental Technology Verification, ETV. So again, that's just an overview of the technology. Um, we can do a whole another seminar if Odell wants us to on UV. Um, it is a neat technology and when sized properly with appliances, quite effective. Um, but again, there's an additional cost up front and the maintenance requirements for it. So we've kind of covered a lot of ground today. We've got about six minutes left. So sorry for going right up to time. Um, there are a lot of variables for us. It all starts with the equipment as we started um, up top and that's the cooking equipment. So as the lineup changes, we like to make sure that we're changing the exhaust volume accordingly. Um, there are height restrictions, fire clearances, budgets, operating schedule. There's lots of information and that's why we find um, so often we get asked, hey, we want to just do this as cheaply as possible without really talking about, okay, well, what's what's the real issue here? What are we trying to do? What are we accomplishing? Uh, we've got some projects that, hey, they're going for LEED certification. Others where it's a university and if they can talk to their dean and say, hey, we're installing a kitchen that's carbon neutral and we can provide all the data behind that. Um, 
they get almost a, a rubber stamp on the budget requirements for the new cafeteria build out and things like that because the university has a uh, carbon footprint reduction mandate. Um, we want to really talk to the whole design team. Um, the engineers are probably for us the most important part of that. Uh, because they're the ones who really understand the energy consumption um, that goes on in these kitchens and the things we can do to minimize that energy. Um, and again, that's why we're here. We know that uh, most of you have dealt with kitchens in the past. In a lot of cases, we've got engineering firms who have a specialist on staff who is their kitchen guru who works specifically at kitchens, which is great. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, our reps can work with them directly, get them what they need. But where there are questions, where there are challenges, uh, we enjoy stepping in and adding value at every step along the way. So in summary, um, we have covered a lot of ground. We typically prefer energy efficient solutions, and that's where for a first step forward, we are always, um, unless asked otherwise, we are gonna pitch um, a high efficiency system. Um, in some cases, we're just going to do hoods. In some cases, we're going to do hoods plus demand controls. And then in other situations, um, we're going to add in that heat recovery. Uh, but what matters to us most is happy customers. And I use customers, and that's kind of a, a broad term for us because there's a lot of stakeholders that we deal with, food service consultants, engineers, owners, architects, reps. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody in that value chain feels like they're getting value from spring air throughout the process. So I guess in summary, uh, we prefer happy customers and you, the engineering community are a very important part of that. So we encourage you to work through Odell or even directly with us if you need um, to make sure we can add value to your kitchen ventilation projects. With that, uh, do we have any questions, comments or nasty remarks? <laughs> Ah, the silence is deafening. I love it. That means we did a great job and went through everything um, in a good way. There's Mike. Thank you. Of course, when I go on, the construction starts again. But uh, anyways, I uh, appreciate uh, Spring Air for, for doing this for us. I hope uh, everyone got something out of that. And like you said, if there is questions, um, Odell's got over a, a thousand hoods over the years installed, whether it be, uh, and I don't use that as a, it's a literal term. We do have over a thousand hoods installed yeah. out there. Um, whether it's grocery trains, culinary kitchens, colleges, things like that commercial kitchens, even ghost kitchens, we're starting to see a lot more yeah. where it's basically Uber based kitchens um, and mom and pa shops. We, we've, we've done them all. So if there is a selection out there that you need help on, I mean, we're, we're more than willing to do that. We have a, a system, a selection program called SQS that's can spit out 98% of, of the uh, options out there. If there is something that's customized, we might take a day or two to, to do it. But for the most part, we can handle um, any selection that's that's required. Um, and to top off his true flow, uh, I saw you saw the term true flow quite a bit. Um, it is covered or some of it is covered by uh, Enbridge through their incentive yeah. program. So anywhere between twelve hundred and nine thousand dollars, depending on um, the CFM and whether or not it's a retrofit or new construction, there is money back for the uh, for the owner. So you can take his uh, payback and, and minus the twelve to uh, nine thousand dollars. Uh, from that payback period as well. So yep. um, that's all I have. I, I do truly appreciate everyone for, for being here. Um, and yeah, well, it's, uh, if there's a kitchen out there, please, please reach out to us. Oh, we got one. Perfect. Um, so I see a couple of quick questions. Um, what are the requirements for induction cooking versus natural gas? Um, typically, induction cooking actually requires a little less exhaust. Um, and that's simply because you don't have all the heat that's coming off um, and creating that, call it thermal plume um, during the cooking. It's a lot more specific, but um, we are finding more and more places going all electric with appliances. And that's something it's really easy to do in our selection program. You simply can designate whether appliance is electric or gas um, and we'll design the system accordingly. Uh, another question about grease removal from the coils. Um, and again, that's where we always specify that only after our uh, KES system, which is removing 99.97% of that grease um, prior to getting to that heat recovery coil. Um, and then, yes, um, back up just in case the radiant. 
I'm not sure I understand um, the question about the radiant system. Um, are we talking UV or are we talking heat recovery? UV. Um, so UV system, no. I mean, this is the interesting thing with UV. If the UV system um, is not maintained, it's essentially not removing the grease and odors from the air. Um, so that grease and odor is going to build up in the ductwork just like the old, um, just like without it. Um, and that's one of the things that I find is kind of interesting. Um, when UV is sold, it's, it's sold to minimize duct cleaning and minimize grease and odors. Um, and so that's happening, um, but NFPA also says you have to get your duct works uh, inspected on a regular basis, um, which means that you've got a duct cleaning company usually coming and inspecting. Um, I would say they are more likely than not to lean towards, yes, we should clean. Um, and if you stop maintaining the system, that will just build up quicker. Um, so instead of paying for cleaning the bulbs and replacing the bulbs, you're, pay, you're paying for cleaning the ductwork on a more regular basis. So it's, I don't say it's left pocket, right pocket, but um, there are a lot of really good applications. So some of them um, we have are big commercial clients where um, they don't want it, grease and odors to go onto the roof. Um, whether it's on the membrane, physically grease getting on the membrane or odors going into um, neighboring residential units, they will specify UV and ensure that it's properly maintained. That's a great situation where, yes, we would recommend it. Um, and then, so Gerald, yes, uh, we always put a KES in front of the coils. Um, Yes, and uh, Andrew, again, the UV stuff, as long as it's effectively specified and maintained, it is it does a really, really good job of of maintaining the grease. Uh, duct temperature to control ventilation rate. Yeah, so we can do it in three ways. We find duct temperature is about 96% um, of cases the best option for it. We can also add optical sensors. Um, so those sense smoke in the hood and then infrared sensors, which detect heat on the appliances. However, we actually find most of the times these are false positives, i.e. they make the system ramp up um, sooner than really necessary. So you're not getting the efficiency um, that's really designed and needed for the systems. Three minutes over. It's been two minutes since the last question, so hopefully that's sufficient. But um, I can stay here all day. I don't know about Mike, and so he opened. No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, in that event, thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate your time. And uh, you can always uh, get in touch with Odell. I know you've got their con. To <laughs> we have our ducks in a row. That's good. I like it. Um, you can always contact Odell. They'll get a hold of us. Um, they're usually really quick. Um, and our good partners, they've done, like I said, they've been doing this almost as long as we have. So. Um, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.